From a leadership perspective, I needed to learn several key leadership behaviors over time to be able to really fulfill the needs of what my players are. Matthew Raidbard is the author of the new book, Lead Like a Pro. He's also the Executive Senior Associate Athletic Director for Administration, Compliance, and Student-Athlete Success at the University of Hartford. Matthew was previously a college basketball coach for more than a decade. After graduating from Indiana University, his first college basketball coaching job was at Western New Mexico University. After leaving Western New Mexico, Matthew served as a men's basketball coach at Dartmouth College, Florida Gulf Coast University, and Chicago State University. While working at Chicago State, he completed his doctorate in educational leadership, where his dissertation focused on determining the best leadership style and behaviors for athletic coaches to practice. His book, Lead Like a Pro, provides coaches with foundational leadership knowledge and the tools to become the type of leader that aligns with their personal values and beliefs. Hey, hoop heads. I wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user-friendly machines on the market. Sign up now for their virtual camp 2.0 featuring 10 days of workouts with pro trainers from the Dr. Dish family. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com and follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Mention the Hoopheads podcast and save an extra $300 on the Dr. Dish Rebel, All-Star, and CT models. Visit drdishbasketball.com for details. That's a great deal, Hoopheads. Get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. Hi, this is Kyle Cavanaugh from Essential Coaching, and you're listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast. If you're looking to improve your coaching, please consider joining the Hoop Heads Mentorship Program. We believe that having a mentor is the best way to maximize your potential and become a transformational coach. By matching you up with one of our experienced mentors, you'll develop a one-on-one -on -one relationship that will help your coaching, your team, your program, and your mindset. The Hoop Heads Mentorship Program delivers mentoring services to basketball coaches at all levels through our team of experienced head coaches. Find out more at HoopHeadsPod.com or shoot me an email directly, Mike at HoopHeadsPod.com. Follow us on social media at HoopHeadsPod on Twitter and Instagram, and be sure to check out the Hoop Heads Podcast Network for more great basketball content. Prepare like the pros with the all-new Fast Draw and Fast Scout. FastDraw has been the number one play diagramming software for coaches for years. You'll quickly see why Fast Model Sports has the most compelling and intuitive basketball software out there. For a limited time, Fast Model is offering new subscribers 10% off FastDraw and Fast Scout. Just use the code SAVE10 at checkout to grab your discount, and you'll be on your way to more efficient game prep and improved communication with your team. Fast Model also has new coaching content every week on its blog plus play and drill diagrams on its play bank. Check out the links in the show notes for more. Fast Model Sports is the best in basketball. Take some notes on leadership as you listen to this episode with Matthew Raidbard, author of Lead Like a Pro. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel tonight. And we are pleased to welcome to the podcast the author of of the new book, Lead Like a Pro, Matthew Raidbard. Matthew, welcome to the Hoop Heads Pod. Thanks so much for having me on, guys. I'm excited to be here. We are excited to be able to talk to you about your book. It dovetails with a lot of the themes that we've talked about here on the podcast in the past. Before we get into your background, I want to give you a chance to give us the 30-second elevator pitch on your book. Just tell us a little bit about Lead Like a Pro and what it's all about. Yeah. So, you know, I wrote the book for coaches at all levels of sports, and I really wanted it to be a, a resource for coaches to be able to learn more about leadership practice and leadership styles, and then how to apply them to their own coaching careers. So I really wanted to make it one of those books that, you know, coaches could get and 
you know, have in their office and, and dog year and come back to as, as their leadership practice and their coaching style continues to evolve year after year. Excellent. We're going to dive deeper into the book in a few minutes, but before we do that, just to give people a little bit of a perspective on where you're coming from, let's talk a little bit about your background, both in athletics and in coaching. Take us back to when you were a kid and walk us through how you eventually got into the coaching profession. Yeah. So, you know, I always loved basketball growing up, uh, love playing basketball. You know, my dad hung a, a hoop on the garage when I was young and stay out there until it was too dark to see the hoop, just shooting baskets, working on my game. Um, and, you know, I, I was really tall growing up. So I gravitated to basketball and I, I had some success and I, you know, I was always the center of the big man and, um, you know, did pretty well. And when I was in the eighth grade, I was six feet tall and I never grew another inch. And at that point in high school, I started looking around and the guards were as tall as me, but I had only big man skills. So I kind of realized, you know, maybe this isn't for me, but I always loved basketball. I always loved college basketball, you know, growing up, I, you know, I never, I never fake sick during those first few days of the tournament. I always fake sick so I could stay home during championship week on that, on that Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Cause I always love watching the conference tournaments, that winner go home mentality. You never know what's going to happen. And I especially love watching the, the smaller schools, the one bid leagues, the mid majors, I loved watching those championship games and seeing when they won the players and the coaches run onto the court and just, just that outpouring of emotion at making the NCAA tournament. And I, I just, I wanted that feeling and I wanted to be a college basketball coach. And uh, as I kind of progressed in high school a little bit, my, my dad was coaching my brother's team, my younger brother, and I started helping him out. And, and I pretty quickly, you know, realized I had a love, for it. And, and I, I seemed like I was pretty good at it and related to the kids pretty well. And I, I eventually took it over. I did that during college and um, it just became my dream just to be a college basketball coach. So when my, my time in college was winding down, I figured that was the best time for me to go and pursue my dream. All right. So if my information is correct, you have a degree in history and classical studies from Indiana University. Is that right? That is right. All right. So how does that take you from uh, that being your major to coaching? Did you, in other words, did you always know when you selected that major was the idea that maybe you were going to be a history teacher and a coach? Did you know you wanted to coach college basketball as opposed to high school basketball? Just explain to me how you went from that major to, Hey, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to coach, especially since you had coaching in the back of your mind, it sounds like for a long time. Yeah, so I, I always knew I wanted to coach college basketball specifically. Just everything about college sports just always spoke to me. Uh, you know, just the the pageantry, the tradition, you know, the tournaments, the conferences, the mascots, everything just always spoke to me. So it was always college basketball that I, I wanted to coach and that I loved. Um, you know, for me, like a lot of things in my life, you know, I, the decision to be a, a history and classical studies major, it started off with, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't really have a, a career, a specific career path in mind or a specific major in mind when I got to college, but I always loved history. I, I always loved Roman history. And I just decided, okay, I don't know what I want to do, but let me take a few classes that at least are interesting to me and, and see where things go. And um, that's always kind of been my personality, which is, you know, follow the things that are interesting to me and see where they lead and kind of let those things play out. So, um, but as I kind of went through college and, and all my friends and everybody around me was kind of figuring out what they wanted to do, you know, I, I thought maybe I could be a teacher, maybe I could, you know, go back, you know, go do more school. Um, I, but I, nothing really spoke to me. It was always in the back of my mind, you know, college basketball, coaching, coaching. And, and it was one of those things where it wasn't until I was getting ready to start my last semester when I said, you know, I don't really know what I want to do, but just like history, classical studies, I always loved it. So I went with it and it, it worked out pretty well. I, I had a great experience. You know, I, I, I always wanted to be a coach. Why, why put that dream off? Why wait? You know, let's just go for it now. What was that pursuit like of the first job? Because 
we know that in a lot of cases, when you're talking about college basketball positions, you're talking about people that have a network or are connected to someone. So how did you go about getting connected to your first job, which was at Western New Mexico University? How did you find that job? Honestly, guys, and to this date, um, I am I am terrible at networking. I, I just, <laughs> you know, my wife always kids me that, um, you know, I'm like adverse to chit chatting. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm always like, let's work, let's get something done, let's figure something out. Um, and she's always telling me like, you got to network, you got to chit chat. Like when I was a coach, she was always like, Pat, you got to talk to people. You can't just like go to the final four and just go to all the actual lectures. Like you got to actually talk to people here. Um, but, you know, but, you know, breaking in, um, you know, I, I, I got no relatives. I didn't play college basketball, no relatives who were in college coaching, no friends, nothing like that. Um, but, you know, the kind of other thing about me is I, I'm never afraid to try anything um, because I would rather just try it and fail um, then, then not try it at all. So I, I just started thinking of ways, like, how could I reach out to coaches? How could I, you know, I'm this unknown guy. How could I kind of try to create this networking opportunity? And, um, so I basically just kind of wrote up like a coaching resume of, you know, the, the accomplishments that I, we had had coaching my brother's travel team. Cause we, we had been very good. So I kind of created a little coaching resume and wrote a cover letter and, um, decided that I was going to email just every coach, I, you know, starting, I just started with America East Albany, uh, you know, went to their staff directory, picked out that head coach and sent him my email, sent him my letter with my, my whole thing about, you know, I love coaching. I'm trying to break in and I'm willing to do anything and if you'll give me a chance. And, um, I'll never forget 18 minutes in, I wasn't even through emailing all the America East schools. I got, I got my first rejection. Um, <laughs> thanks for the email, but, um, you know, we don't have any opportunities, but, you know, I went through all of division one, then I went to division two and three and NAIA and junior college and repeat. And, you know, along the way, some coaches, I, you know, a, a lot of coaches responded. They were, they were super nice. Um, some of them offered advice. They said, keep in touch. But on my second time around, um, the head coach, Mark Coleman at Western New Mexico, he emailed me and he said, uh, you know, I got your emails and my assistant might be leaving this summer. Keep in touch. And so I kept in touch and I, I emailed him every two weeks you know, on the date, every two weeks, Monday, sent him an email following up. And eventually his assistant coach left, um, you know, right, you know, in the middle of the summer. And he said to me, he said, look, you know, I, I can't fly out here. I was living in Chicago at the time. He said, I can't fly out. I can't even pay for your gas. But if you can get yourself out here, we can do an interview. And so I drove, it's uh, 20, about 24 hours, 1600 miles from Chicago to Silver City. I drove to Silver City and I got there, um, drove in, it was about two, two days. And then I drove in the next morning and um, we did the interview. And that night he offered me the job. And a couple of weeks later, I was uh, making that drive again, moving back out to Silver City to start working. That's quite a story. I give you credit for sending those emails. When I graduated from college, I wanted to be a graduate assistant. And the year that I graduated, 1992, unfortunately, was the year that the NCAA cut back from two graduate assistants per Division I staff to one. And I was in the days pre-email. So I was typing out letters and printing them on my dot matrix printer in my dorm room, which needless to say, I was not nearly as efficient, I'm sure, as you were in utilizing email. So I did not email every single coach at all the different levels of college basketball like you did. And eventually I gave up on like you who continued to pursue it. And I decided to go and eventually go a different direction and go back to school. I had a business degree and went back to school so I could teach and eventually coach in high school for you getting that first college job. What was unique about it or what was something that maybe you didn't realize you were going to have to do as a coach 
that was a new experience for you? Because obviously you hadn't necessarily been around a college basketball staff. You had been around the game as a coach with your brother's travel team, but a little bit different at the college level. What do you remember about that? You know, honestly, I was totally naive to what it, what it meant to be a college basketball coach. So I, honestly, I, and it, it's, it feels so silly to even say it now after all these years, but I took that job and I thought, I'm a college coach now. This is my full-time job, essentially. I am going to recruit. I'm going to coach at practice and I'm going to coach at the games. And there'll be, you know, a few other things, sure. But that's going to be most of my job. And I'll never forget, I, I wasn't even a month in. I called my dad and I said, dad, like, when do I get to do that stuff? Like, I'm, I'm checking classes. I'm monitoring study hall. I'm taking the guys to eat. I'm driving them around. We're sitting in my office, you know, having therapy sessions. We're talking through things like, dad, I I'm doing all this other stuff. I had no idea I was going to have to do. And I, cause I just didn't realize like coaches are asked to do so many different things. It's even more. I mean, every year I was in coaching, I was doing more things that are outside of traditional X's and O's recruitment yeah. there. You, you just, the job is just so much bigger or it was so much bigger when I got into coaching than I ever thought it was going to be. Yeah. I think that most people, even if you've been in the profession and, or you've been a player or you've been a manager, which is a route that a lot of coaches are taking now to get into college coaching. I still think that when you become a full-time assistant coach, there's a lot of things that you don't necessarily realize that you have to do. And we've talked to a lot of coaches too, Matthew, who have transitioned from being an assistant coach to a head coach. And that theme I think is pretty similar there too, where, they say, boy, I didn't realize all the things that my head coach had to do or has to do when I'm an assistant that I just kind of take for granted because the head coach has so many more responsibilities as the leader of the program. I think it's a great point that you make that as you're going through, and I think this speaks to high school coaches as well, that there's just way more responsibility and time currently than there ever has been in the past. So, does that new experience, does that cement your idea that, hey, I love what I'm doing, even though it wasn't what, even though there's a lot more to it than what I thought, did you immediately fall in love with all those things that you had to do beyond maybe what you thought you were going to do going in? So I did. And, and what it taught me, my, my two years at Western Mexico taught me was, you know, I love college basketball and I love coaching but those are really just vehicles for what my passion was, which was working with and helping young people learn, grow, and develop. And that's, that's what it boiled down to what I was doing with, you know, the, the kids on my brother's travel team was, I, you know, I found so much um, just fulfillment and happiness in, in watching their success. And I didn't understand it at the time. At the time, I thought winning feels good right? This, this is great. I want to win. I want to be the coach. I want to be responsible for it. But as I kind of matured in coaching, I realized, yeah, those are, those are the things I love. Those are, those are the vehicles for me to be able to do what I'm really passionate about, which is, which is helping young people through the sport of basketball, particularly college age kids. That's a really, really good way to put it. I think when people ask me, in fact, I just had a a questionnaire that I filled out today because I'm going to be a guest on a podcast tomorrow. And one of the questions they asked me was, what's your coaching why? And my answer for my coaching why is almost exactly verbatim what you just said, which is I get to use a game that I love to be able to have an impact on the players that I coach, both hopefully on and off the court. And I think if you're doing that as a coach, then you're really serving the players that are underneath your tutelage as a coach. And to me, that's really what it's all about. And when I think about what drives me in the game of basketball, I think I'm a lot like you in that early on coaching was much more about me and what I could get out of it or what I could put into it. And as I've gotten older, I've realized that it's a lot more about 
the kids that are in front of me, whether it's at one of my basketball camps or it's a AAU team that I'm coaching or whatever it may be, that it becomes more about them and less about me. And that's something that I didn't come to right away in my career. It's something that it took me a long time, I think, to get there, maybe longer than it should have. But when you think back to those early years and then you had an opportunity to go to a couple other places. So let's just kind of buzz through your stops. Tell us a little bit, about maybe one thing or two things that you learned at each of your other three stops. And then we'll get, uh, then I want to dive into the book. So your next stop after Western New Mexico is Dartmouth. How do you get to the Ivy league? So b- basically same way. Um, just went back. I, I committed to two years of Western Mexico had a really great experience, was ready for the next experience, and just went back to the emailing, just sending out my resume, sending out information, and um, was really fortunate. Had another kind of similar similar circumstance where, um, you know, Terry Dunn, who is my head coach at Dartmouth, just said, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be here. Can you make it here? Let's have an interview, talk it through, and um, so kind of kind of went through that kind of similar exercise to get out to Dartmouth and. The Dartmouth experience was a such a polar opposite to the Western Mexico experience. I went from rural New Mexico. Now I'm in the Ivy League. And but what I, what I realized in the Ivy League or when I was at Dartmouth and now I'm at Division One was, you know, it's go time here. Like when I was at Division Two, OK, you know, my my head coach was great. He understood I'm learning. You know, I, when I got to Western Mexico, half the players were older than me. You know, it was one of those where like you're, you're working, you're working out some bugs, you're working through things. You know, when I got to Dartmouth, you know, I, we had two really great experienced other assistant coaches on the staff. This is their life. They've been in this 20, 25 years. This is their life there. There's no messing around. There's no kind of, you know, oh, you know, I, I got to take it slow. I got to figure it, it's go time. Like you got to move, you got to be learning on the fly. You got to be absorbing things really fast. And you got to be ready to go. And um, it took me a little while to get up to speed. And thankfully, I had a couple of really good mentors there with other assistant coaches who were willing to coach me um, because, uh, you know, there were points early on there where things are moving fast. I'm trying to learn the terminology. I'm trying to learn all these different things we're doing. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm falling behind. I'm drowning a little bit here. And I was really lucky there that you know, they were kind of coaching me up and, and working through some things with me, but the pace really picked up when I, when I got to Dartmouth and, and got to division one. I would imagine. Yeah. As you get to a different level and obviously you reach the highest level of college basketball at division one, that there is a different set of responsibilities, a different pace, as you said, and just a different, I would imagine, even though it's the Ivy league, a different pressure around that coaching staff. And as you said, when you're dealing with, people who that's their career, that's their livelihood. And as much as they might want to hold your hand and coach you, there's still a, Hey, we got to get this st- stuff done. And I'm sure that it accelerated your learning curve as you, you know, went into your continue to go on in your career, your next two stops, Florida Gulf coast, and then Chicago state where you spent eight years there. Talk us, uh, talk us through those two stops quickly. And then we'll dive into the book. Yeah. You know, Florida Gulf coast, was, uh, you know, I, I was really fortunate to have a lot of good experiences, work for some really good people, uh, work for Dave Balls of their tremendous human being, um, like all the guys I work for. And so that, that was a, a good transition there for me, had a, a really nice staff, um, coach was, was really great, really inclusive with the staff. So had a good experience there, really kind of grounding myself in division one, taking some of those things I learned at Dartmouth and, and applying some of them. And then, you know, just kind of taking all those experiences, going to Chicago State where, um, you know, walking in, our head coach, Tracy Dildy, my mentor, um, you know, new staff, brand new staff, all walking in together, same time, and really getting to kind of build from the ground up our vision of what we wanted the team and the program to be and kind of go through all those failures, successes, failures, successes, and really just uh, there, being there for eight years, really be able to see kind of that whole life cycle of the program through, uh, which was just a, a tremendous experience and, and really had a, a huge impact on me as a coach, a person. And also, you know, once I got into administration and, and moving forward in other leadership roles. At what point does the idea of writing this book come on the horizon for you? When do you start thinking about it? Is it something that 
you've had in the back of your mind that, hey, someday I'd like to write a book? Was it something that you had a moment of inspiration? How did it come to you? So 13, 12, 13, when I was at Chicago State, uh, you know, won the conference championship, went to postseason, had a, a great year. 13, 14, uh, we were in the, the WAC, the Western Athletic Conference, had a really great year, had some big wins. And I felt like I had a lot of momentum in my coaching career and went into that summer after the 13, 14 season, um, you know, coach and I thought, you know, it's time to, to move up, get another job, really start pushing my career forward. And I, I couldn't get another job. Um, and I went back to Chicago state. We had built for four years. We kind of reached a little bit of a peak. Um, that next year we took a step back, you know, we, we were struggling a little bit and I started thinking to myself, you know, what can I do to, to make myself better? What can I do to advance my career, make myself different? I always tell young coaches, you know, th this is a really difficult profession. You, you got to do things to, to make yourself stand out. So I decided at that point to uh, explore going back to school. When I was in Western Mexico, I got my master's in education leadership and um, just started thinking about going back to school, maybe pursuing a doctorate. And uh, Chicago State, it just happened to work out that Chicago State originally was a teacher's college and they had a, an educational leadership doctoral program. And so spent 15, 16, just doing everything to, to go through that whole application process, taking the GREs, doing all that stuff again and, and got accepted and entered the program and, and was doing the program while I was coaching. And um, it was just learning so much, applying it to my, my coaching career. And it was when I was doing my dissertation, which was on athletic coach, you know, college basketball leadership practice where I kind of went through that whole study and I realized in that study from, from the data and, and all the research that coaches were not receiving enough leadership training and they didn't have enough leadership resources to really reach their leadership potential. And I had this aha moment when I'm going through this data and coming to these conclusions that I, you know, I've identified a problem. I'm always big on, if you identify a problem, don't just say what the problem is provide solutions for that problem, do something about that problem you've identified. So I thought, you know, I've identified this problem. I can relate to it because I've been a coach who has been looking for leadership tools and resources my whole career uh, and not found as many of them as I would have hoped. So what can I do to kind of help fill this gap for coaches? And that was the aha moment to me to take what I had done in my research and turn it into a book that was, you know, like I, I talked about earlier, that was a resource for coaches to be able to help them be better leaders. What do you remember about that first day sitting down to start writing? So, you know, I, I remember a lot of things, but, um, you know, I remember being a little panicked. Um, <laughs> I remember thinking, you know, like, like in a lot of things, you know, you, you take these risks and you get there and you have this moment of, oh my gosh, I'm actually doing this. I have to do this now. I had it when I got to Western New Mexico and I looked around and said, okay, I, I have to go be a college basketball coach. Now I have to figure this out right now. Same thing with the book. I, I had the idea. I, it sounded great. I, you know, I found an editor. I, you know, I made a pitch. I, I found an editor, Mascot Books. They've been tremendous. Um, and they said, okay, great, let's do it. And, you know, we got off the phone and then that night I, I sat down on the computer and I said, oh my God, I have to do this now. <laughs> like I, I am committed to this. I have to do this. And, um, just one of those moments. And then, then of course, you know, you, you sit there at the computer for a little while and you tell yourself you can do this. You've done, you know, difficult things before. And eventually you get to the point where, okay, I, I believe it now. And, and I'm going to start writing and you just go from there. Did you put together an outline first of the total scope of the book, or did you just start writing, getting thoughts down on paper and then thinking about organizing them maybe later after the fact, which process better describes how you went about it? So I, I put together an outline. I had the idea to do the book. So, you know, I, I Googled, how do you, um, how do you write a book proposal um, to pitch an editor? And I kind of followed that format and, um, I kind of had an outline in my head, 
that ended up being somewhat true to the book. It definitely changed somewhat during the writing process, but I started out with kind of the outline and then filled it in with some ideas so that the pitch had enough substance to where they kind of saw the direction of where the book was going to go. And also I kind of knew once I sat down, okay, I don't have to totally panic here. I've got a bunch of ideas. I just need to start. I started expanding on them. That's a good way to look at it. I think that when you start to try to organize yourself in any way, shape or form, any type of writing, I think when you sit down and you start to put those thoughts down on paper, it can take that panic away. I know that I've written not a book, but I've written lots of blog posts and I actually collaborated with my dad on a couple of books, but I would say he probably took the lead on those back in the day. But nonetheless, when you sit down to write, it feels like before you put pen to paper or before you start typing on the computer, it can be very, very over overwhelming. And then once you realize, hey, I do have a lot of ideas, I do have a lot of things that I can get out there and then organize them and then get them to fit into the structure that you've developed. And it seems like that's sort of what you were able to do. Are you tired of slipping and sliding on the court and sticky sheets just aren't giving you grip? Grip Spritz solves this problem without having to lick your hand to clean your shoes. Grip Spritz is used by countless AAU, high school and college programs, semi-pro teams, as well as NCAA athletes and G League players. Unlike other products, Grip Spritz has solutions for individual players, not just entire teams. We've used Grip Spritz at our Head Start basketball camps and players love it. To keep you and your team from slipping and sliding, visit gripspritz.net to learn more. One of the things that, as I'm looking through and, and thinking about your book, one of the words that comes through a lot is the word intentional and the need for coaches to be intentional about what they do with leadership. And actually, that's one of my favorite words, and Jason can probably attest to this, that I've used this in a lot of different interviews when talking about coaches and when talking about things that coaches should or shouldn't do. And I relate that to myself and to lots of coaches in the profession that oftentimes there's things that we want to do, but it's easy for those things to slip away when we're not intentional. So just talk about how important it is in your mind for coaches to be intentional about the way they lead. So, you know, I, and I totally agree. I, and I absolutely, I talk about intentionality a lot because without being intentional, you lose out on a lot of the potential outcomes and process that you can get from, from making attention to this decision. So I kind of boil it down to, you know, when you're looking at anything. So when I'm looking at, at leadership practice, right, if I just go out there and I say, I'm going to do these things. I'm just, I'm going to go with my gut. I'm just going to coach from the hip. Okay. If it works, I don't entirely know why. If it doesn't work, I don't entirely know why. But if I say, okay, you know, I, I've, I've gotten some leadership training. I've thought about this a lot. I know what my coaching style is. I know the, the type of leader I want to be. You know, for me, I, I always gravitated toward transformational leadership. Just, I, I'm just a positive person, try to be upbeat, motivational, uplifting. I always want to develop personal relationships with my players. If, if I've done the, the background work and, I, and I've done the reflection and I know those things about myself and I know about transformation leadership, now I can go and say, I'm going to put those things into practice. And then if they work, it's a lot easier for me to go back to the process and figure out why and replicate it. Or if they're not working, if I'm not getting those outcomes, again, I can go back and, and self-critique and say, okay, maybe in these situations, I wasn't doing this certain thing the way that I wanted to, or it didn't work out the way that I wanted to. So for me, you know, being intentional, it, it goes back to really having that, that being in touch with, this is what I, this is what I'm about. This is my, these are my values and beliefs. And then building off of that and making very specific decisions so that you can get those outcomes that you want. And if you don't know why, so that you can work on, you know, whatever you realize the issue was and make yourself better. So 
uh, I am totally with you that making intentional choices is so key to the book. And I think what I hear you saying is that that intentionality allows you then to self-evaluate both in a positive and a negative way. In other words, what am I doing that's working? What am I doing that's not working? And if I've been intentional about the choices that I've made as a leader, then I can go back and evaluate those choices and figure out, okay, I need to do more of these positive things. I need to do less of these negative things. And that starts to lead me down a path of being the type of leader that I want to be. And one of the things that you have in chapter one of the book is talking about how coaches have to make sure that the way that they lead is true to themselves, that they're not just trying to copy another coach. They're not just trying to be Mike Krzyzewski. They're not just trying to be Greg Popovich because that's what they see on TV, but instead they're true to their personality. They have to lead. One of the things you always hear coaches say, you hear people say it in all walks of life that players, kids, employees, if you're not true to yourself, if you're trying to be something that you're not, it's easy to sniff that out. So just talk about why it's important to be yourself when it comes to being a leader in your mind. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, and I feel like that's a very common mistake for, you know, coaches at all levels, uh, all experience levels, but particularly young coaches. I know that was something that was a kind of mistake that I fell into early in my career was, you know, not having really a lot of really any experience in, in college coaching, you know, I naturally gravitated towards, you know, what are the most successful leaders doing? What are the best coaches doing? I'm going to watch them. I'm going to study them. I'm going to read their books and I'm going to go replicate it and I'm going to be successful. And, you know, through some trial and error, I realized that, you know, the reason why Mike Krzyzewski, Greg Popovich, so many other coaches are as successful as they are is because they've figured out what are their personal values and beliefs, what's important to them, what's important for them to portray to their team. And then they've aligned their leadership practice with those things. And that's what makes them successful. They know exactly who they are and all the decisions that they make for their teams, for their athletes, supports those beliefs. So if you believe you're a positive person, then your actions should then reflect upon that belief that you have. And no leaders are the same, right? Nobody has the exact same leadership style as anybody else. But the best leaders, like you said, they know exactly who they are. It doesn't mean that they don't make mistakes. It doesn't mean they're, they're perfect and true to that 100% of the time. But because they know who they are as a leader and they're always making decisions in support of that, they have the opportunity, like we talked about, to be intentional, to self-critique, but to always get better because they're staying true to who they are. And I think that also goes to what you touch on in chapter two, which is that there is no one perfect leadership style. There is no one way to do coaching correctly. You can go and watch successful coaches at any level of the game. We're talking AAU basketball. We're talking high school basketball, college basketball, pro basketball. There are coaches that do it differently and yet are successful. And I think that's something that, as you've said, is really important to keep in mind that when you are true to yourself, your style is not going to look exactly like the coach down the road, the coach on TV. It's going to be a style that's unique to your own. And so you want to make sure that you understand that you can have a style that is all your own and can still be successful. And I think when I was thinking about this particular topic, I think about that in terms of when you're an assistant coach working for a head coach and your personal leadership style as an assistant coach may be different from your head coaches and trying to figure out and navigate what that looks like in the relationship. So when you think about some of the coaches that you've worked for and you think about their leadership style compared to your own, how did they influence you in the way they led? And then conversely, how did you think about trying to maybe take some of the things that they did that you felt fit what you did 
or fit what you were like, and then maybe some things that they did that didn't fit with your leadership style that you eliminated. So just talk about how you looked at the relationship with your head coaches over the course of your coaching career. That was definitely something that was, that was always evolving for me. So, you know, early in my career, I thought, well, my leadership needs to align with what my coaches is, right? That's how I support my coach is I do the things that they do. And, you know, I, I kind of quickly realized that, no, that's, that's not how this works. I, I need to be myself, but you know, that doesn't mean that my leadership behavior should be opposite theirs, or I can't have some of their leadership behaviors. I just have to figure it out for myself. You know, one thing, you know, when I, when I was at Chicago state um, and I worked for, for Tracy Dildy there, you know, our personalities are polar opposites. I am, like I said, I'm not a networker. I'm, I'm much more introverted. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm somebody who doesn't say a lot at practice, but when I do, I want it to have an impact. Um, coach is totally different. I mean, coach at the final four, we can't even walk down the hall because everybody has come up to coach wanting to talk to him. He is, you know, the, the, the bright spot in the room. He can talk to anybody. He's extroverted. Um, he talks to the players totally different than I do. Um, we're, we're like polar opposites in every way. And when I got to Chicago State and I kind of realized this because I didn't know him prior to getting to Chicago State, um, I, I thought, well, I, I need to change. I got to be more like coach if I'm going to be on his staff. Um, you know, I got to try to be more outgoing. I've got to try to be, you know, communicate with the players more frequently. I got to do all these different things so that I could be more like coach. And what I realized, you know, through that first year and into the second year was, you know, it's actually a positive thing for me that coach and I are so different because, you know, we could be compliments to each other. He could learn things from my leadership and I could learn things from his leadership. And, you know, one of the big things that I, I learned from coach and it was something that I, I hadn't really, really understood the importance of before was loyalty, loyalty to your fellow coaches on the staff, loyalty to the players, loyalty to the program. Um, you know, coach, you know, I always used to watch coach that first year. He used to take so much money out of his own pocket to pay for these extra things for the players. And I used to think to myself, you know, do the players really need it? Like coach, you're taking, you know, you're taking this money out of your pocket. Like, and, but that was his way of being loyal to the players and investing back into the program. And he always used to say that, you know, if we're not loyal to each other, if we're not loyal to ourselves, if we're not willing to invest in ourselves and each other, how can we expect anybody outside of, of this team to? And, I, you know, I realized from, from that leadership that that was something I, I wanted to add to my own leadership practice. That was an amazing trait and leadership behavior that I wanted to add, right? So it wasn't about, you know, coach and mind's personalities are totally different. That's fine. That doesn't matter. Um, we could still learn tons for each from each other. And there's things that he does in his leadership practice that I could add to my own. So, you know, it's about finding that balance, making sure you're still supporting your coach, but doing it in the way that like we talked about is true to you, that I'm not all of a sudden changing my personality, um, and, and being disingenuous about who I am, because I think that's what somebody else wants me to do, or I think that'll help me better fit in on, on the staff and the team. That makes a lot of sense to me when I think about just how the coaching profession works in general. When you think about coaches borrowing, stealing, whatever you want to call it, whether it's X's and O's, whether it's things that coaches do to build team camaraderie, whether it's leadership, I think coaches, the best ones, borrow, steal, use things that they observe from other coaches and they make it their own in some way. And I think that's what you're describing there is no, you're not going to turn into the exact same personality, the exact same leadership style as the head coach that you work for. But even if you have completely different styles of leadership, you can learn from them. And hopefully if they have that growth mindset, they can also learn from you. And as you're going about and you're growing, you're working as a leader and you're coaching one of the things that you talked about a lot in your book is the idea that what a coach thinks they may be doing as a leader may not actually mesh with 
what they are in fact doing. So in other words, in their mind, there may be a disconnect between here's the type of coach and here's the type of leader I think I'm being or that I'm trying to be versus here's what I'm actually doing. And there's this gap in between. Talk a little bit about why you think that gap exists and what we can do to close that gap so that coaches can, again, going back to that word intentional. So coaches can be completely intentional about the type of leader they want to be. If I want to be a transformational coach, how do I make sure that I'm doing that in your mind, Matthew? Yeah. The, you know, my research and, you know, working with college basketball coaches, you know, it, it found that there is this leadership gap and, and the most successful coaches have the smallest leadership gap all the way down to, you know, coaches who are not as successful or, or young coaches who are just, you know, breaking into the profession their leadership gap is a lot bigger. And I attribute that to a couple of things. One is not having enough opportunities for leadership training development um, and not having enough resources to help coaches develop their leadership practice. You know, you know, it's often taught, you know, it's, it's kind of often said that, you know, coaches are CEOs of their programs. We talked about earlier, coaches have to wear all of these different hats. They've got to take on all these leadership responsibilities outside of, of traditional coaching responsibilities. Well, that takes a lot of leadership training and a lot of leadership knowledge to excel in that role. And, you know, when I, when I reflect on and, and talk to my friends who are in business and other professions, I mean, my friends who, who are in, you know, business, for example, they get more leadership training in a year than I've gotten in my 15 year career. And I'm looking for it. There's just not enough coach specific leadership training out there to really help teach coaches one foundational leadership knowledge so that they know about different leadership styles and then provide them with the tools to go out and practice those leadership styles. And oftentimes that's where the disconnect comes. So, you know, in recent years, there, there has been more of an emphasis on leadership in coaching. So I think we're seeing more and more coaches gaining some of that foundational leadership knowledge. They're, they're majoring like I did. And you're getting one example a story I tell in the book, because in the book, I, 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 in order to teach coaches, these give coaches, these tools, I use successes and failures from my own coaching career to kind of illustrate how the, how the leadership behaviors work or how you can go wrong. And, um, you know, I, I tell a story about how you know, I, I really was interested in kind of I was learning about transformational leadership and transactional leadership. And in transactional leadership, you know, it focuses on, you know, punishments to curb negative behaviors, rewards to incentivize the right behaviors. And so I thought to myself, this is right at the beginning of my coaching career. This is like, we haven't even started practice yet. I'm like a month into class, but I, I'm, I'm just really enjoying what I'm, I'm learning and I want to put it into practice. And, um, you know, head coach put myself and another assistant in charge of, of, the, of the team. He went recruiting and we had a situation where we were having an open gym and three, our three captains showed up late and immediately, you know, talk, you know, talked with them and told them that because they were late, they had to run. So in my mind, I'm providing running as a punishment to curb the negative behavior of being late. The problem was, was that I never set a standard or expectation that they had to be there at a certain time or that if they weren't, this was going to happen, that they'd have to run. And I, I missed half of what I, so the guys are, are out there running because, you know, they're, they're just trying, they're just great kids, but they don't even understand what they've done because they thought, well, it's open gym. We're going to come when we come and I'm, you know, standing there like a pit bull with a stopwatch saying, Oh, you're, you're late. So now there needs to be some sort of punishment to curb this. And, you know, I, I didn't set any sort of expectation. I didn't create a standard. And so they didn't understand why they were being punished. Therefore they didn't know what they did wrong and they didn't know how they could correct it for next time. And so I had failed as a leader because I didn't have all the tools and knowledge to be able to practice that leadership style in the way that I wanted to. So it would have the effect that I wanted it to have. And to me, that kind of sums up a lot of what's happening to coaches is, you know, trans, they want to be transformative. They want to be servant leaders, 
but and they've got some knowledge, but it, it takes a lot of, of tools and understanding and training to take that knowledge and put it into practice with your team in order to get the desired outcomes that you want. I think there's still a lot of challenges for coaches when it comes to that difference between transactional and transformational, especially anyone who's my age or certainly older than me. So I'm 51, but we grew up for the most part with transactional coaches, right? I mean, you grow up with the idea that if you do something good, maybe you get rewarded. If you do something bad, you're going to run or you're going to have some type of external punishment and the relationship piece of building that with players. That is such a huge part of becoming a transformational coach. Wasn't always as important as it is today. And I think the athletes of the past, it was just a different era. They didn't, I don't know if want, need, know that it was something that they wanted. Whereas today's athlete, completely different. If you tried to coach a kid today, the way that I was coached in 1989 or 1990, the reaction and how things would go would be far, far different. If you go back and you read season on the brink with Bobby Knight. And you think about if those things were going on in the year 2021, Bob Knight would have a job for like 15 seconds. And yet he's obviously from a wins and losses standpoint. And with a lot of players that he did build relationships with a very successful coach, but we think about the way things are today. It's just completely, completely different. And to your point, I think a lot of coaches are still, there's still that, lingering effect of what coaching used to be like and the my way or the highway coach, the bully pulpit coach versus the coach who's going to build that relationship, who's going to be transformational, who's going to affect their players, not only on the court, but also off the court. And I think that's something that coaches in the past, they just didn't have to concern themselves with in the same way. And you talk about in your book that, coaches have had to transcend beyond the role of just being a coach, meaning a coach on the floor, coaching basketball. There's so many more things that coaches have to do today. So can you share a few of those things that coaches have maybe taken over that they wouldn't have had to do in the past that help them to build better relationships, but also make leadership more of a challenge? So, you know, for me, in, you know, being somebody who feels it's really important and, and my role to develop personal relationships with my players, you know, what comes with that is a lot of responsibility, a lot of leadership responsibility, because now I'm, I'm going to be taking on the role of, you know, mentor, advisor, uh, confidant, uh, could be father figure, uh, you know, just some different roles that I, I took on in my career as I built relationships with my players. And from an emotional standpoint, I felt I could take those things on because I cared about them and, and we had a relationship built on trust and respect. But from a leadership perspective, I needed to learn several key leadership behaviors over time to be able to really fulfill the needs of what my players are. So, you know, for example, one, one leadership behavior that I, I really had to add to my leadership practice and make sure that I, I was practicing was empathy. So, you know, a lot of, you know, early in my career, it was a lot of let's, let's tough it out, but, you know, let's keep going. Don't let things off the court affect you on the basketball court. I'm tuning it out. You tune it out. That's not fair. And that's not, that's not always right. You know, people are going through things. They should be able to People should be able to have a bad day and it could be okay that they're having a bad day when they show up to practice. It might take them a little while to get into practice. That's okay. You can't always leave those things in the locker room, right? So there's some heavy things that people are dealing with and need to be able to have empathy and understanding to, you know, read my player's body language, but also ask them and, and have them trust me and say, are you okay? What's going on? Do you need a minute? Do you want to talk about this? And if they say, no, coach, you know, didn't do well in a test. I'm going to shake it off. No big deal. Okay. But if they say, you know, coach, I'm going through some things right now. I need some time. Be willing to say, okay, that's more important. I'm here for you. We could talk about it when you're ready. 
And I, I really, you know, needed to understand the importance of empathy. Um, you know, another one that I, I've just, I feel like I'm always working on as a leader is listening. And it, I, I, you know, throughout my career, I've mistaken listening for hearing. So the players would be telling me something and I'd be hearing them, but I wouldn't be actively engaged in listening to them. I'd be thinking of my response while they were talking. I didn't want to hear it. No excuses. You know, we're, we're going to get through this, right? I don't want to hear it from you. I just want to tell you what I have to say. I don't want to listen to what you have to say. And you can't build relationship that way. That, that's a one-way relationship. The players don't feel like you're listening to them. They're not going to trust you. They're not going to feel like you support them. And that's going to have an effect on your relationship with them and your ability to coach them. Um, so th those are two that were, were hugely key for me. And there are two that I just, in my leadership practice today, I'm always thinking about and I'm always working on. I love both of those because a lot of what I look at when I think about what makes a successful coach is I don't always look at it honestly from myself as a coach. I think back to my time as a player and I think about what my coaches were like and I think about what I might have wanted them to be like. And when I hear you talking about empathy and getting to understand what was going on in a player's life, I remember very, 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 very few of those conversations that I ever had with any coach I ever played for. I'm sure I can count them on one hand. It just wasn't done. And then on the listening side of it, now we talk to so many coaches who talk about having conversations with players about the culture, about the X and O's, about their life, about what's going on, about what are we going to do in the locker room? And just, it's a much more collaborative process today between players and coaches than it was in the past. And I think it just sets people up much better for success when you have a collaboration where you have both sides that care about one another versus, as you said, I may be a coach standing over here and my players might be talking and I hear their voices, but I'm not really listening and taking into account what they're saying. Or maybe the player's telling me about something that went on in their personal life and I'm just sitting there. Yeah, I hear them, but I'm not really processing what that means and how that's impacting how the player's performing in practice or how they're performing in games or just their general mood and disposition. And it only makes sense when you think about it intuitively that if I get in tune with those things with my players, I'm going to have a much better opportunity to reach them and get the best out of them, not only on the court, but also off the court and in their life, which goes back to what you talked about as being your mission and your why behind coaching is you want to have that kind of impact on your players using the game of basketball that you love. And that's really what leadership is all about. And you talk, as you come towards the end of the book, you talk about having coaches, how they should develop their own definition of success. So maybe you could share your definition of success as a basketball coach, and then maybe give a pointer or two for coaches who want to develop their own definition, how they could go about doing that. So, when looking at success, you know, I, I think it's, it's natural for coaches to look at wins and losses. I looked at wins and losses. I would never tell coaches that they should not incorporate wins and losses into their definition of success, right? Uh, you know, you always want to have goals, you know, whether it's to improve year to year or, you know, in, in particular years, you know, the, the success rate that you have. So I, I, I think having wins and losses incorporated or championships or, or all of those kind of uh, metrics are important for your definition of success because it, it's a part of the profession. But I think that that's one element of it. And, and that's, that could be measurable. You know, did we, we said we're going to win 20 games. We won 18. We didn't meet our measure of success, but I think there need to be other goals measurable, but largely, you know, unmeasurable that, you have for your team that you just know as a leader, okay, we're meeting those or we're not meeting them. And, and one thing is, you know, 
continuous improvement. Do you feel like your team is continually improving? You know, that was one of our big goals when I was at Chicago State. You know, they might have picked us seventh out of eight teams. Maybe our, we didn't say, well, our goal is to win X number of games or our our goal was we want to get better every day. We want to be constantly improving. We're using the eye test. We're, we're, we're reading our players. We're reading our team. And we're kind of measuring, are we getting better? Are we getting better? You know, that was one thing that we talked about a lot that was important to us in our definition of success. You know, another, you know, huge part of it to me is, and this is for coaches at any level, is are your kids having a great experience? You know, for youth sport coaches, are your kids having fun? Are they learning a skill or two? Do they, are they having a positive experience with the game? that, you know, like me, when I was younger and had great coaches, develops a love of the sport to where you stick with it. You know, high school coaches, college coaches, you know, are you giving your kids a great experience? You know, winning certainly is an aspect of that. It it helps the experience. It's positive for the experience, winning versus losing. But do your players feel, are you building strong relationships with your players? Are you getting really good feedback for them? Do you feel like they trust you? Are they demonstrating that they trust you and there's mutual respect there? You know, are you building something where your players are coming back? You know, that, that was a big measure of, for me was after guys graduated, did they keep in touch? Did they come back? Did they support us? You know, did we do a good job giving them a great experience to tie them to the program and to us? And, you know, that's one of my greatest joys you know, once guys leave is, you know, keeping in touch, seeing their success, talking with my former players, um, catching up, you know, seeing what they're doing. And, you know, that was all cultivated in the emphasis that we put on making sure guys had great experiences. And that doesn't mean that we were giving them everything that they wanted or we were sheltering them. That, that's a, that came also from a lot of hard talks, a lot of accountability, a lot of, a lot of standards and expectations, but those were so important in the development and the learning and the growth that we wanted to achieve for our athletes. And so, you know, I kind of look at those definitions of success. Are we, am I doing those things as a coach? Are we doing those things as a staff and a program? And then, you know, for me at the time and now I can be able to look at and say, did we win as many games as I wanted? No. Or championships? Did we have as much success as I would have loved in my coaching career? No, but did you know based on the relationships I have with my players now, based on how you know the men that so many of them have become, which has just been tremendous to watch and follow and just be a small part of? Do I feel like a success? Have I made an impact? You know, being able to look back and say yes is honestly the most fulfilling thing for my coaching career. That's a great answer. And I love the idea, the thought that when players come back and they want to be a part of it, that that sends a clear message that you've done something right. And I think it's so true when you look at whether it's a high school program or it's a college program and you look at those programs that are successful, they're successful because the players that came before want to see the current players continue the tradition and continue the success that they had while they were there. They feel a connection to the school, to the coaches. And really that's all, that's what it's all about. And when you talked about getting those phone calls or getting those messages or getting a visit from a former player, I always say there's nothing better than picking up that phone and having somebody say, Hey coach. And it could be somebody, it's funny. I'm sure you can relate to this, when I, I recently reconnected with three of my college coaches who I hadn't seen really or spoken to probably for 25 years. And I recently had dinner with one of my assistant coaches and I'm 51 years old and he's 77 and I still call him coach. And even though there's some things that I wish were different about the relationship and a lot of the things that we talked about tonight are things that I wish that my coaching staff, particularly in college had done more of, but you go through so many things with them and then the opportunity to reconnect and talk and hear the stories. And part of me wishes I'm like, 
boy, I wish we would have, we would have been able to open up like this back when I was a, back when I was a 20 year old junior in college, as opposed to a 51 year old man, but nonetheless, to be able to connect like that and to be able to have those kinds of conversations, whether no matter which direction you're going, whether it's from my perspective that I just had that dinner where I was the player talking to my coach, or when I get calls from my former players, there's nothing that means more than that. I think that really is the true definition of coaching success and being a great leader as a coach. Before we wrap up, Matthew, I want to give you one more opportunity to share where people can find the book, how they can connect with you, whether that's on social media, website, whatever you want to share so that people can reach out to you, find out more about Lead Like a Pro, and hopefully we can get a few people out there. It's going to be a great resource for coaches. If you want to develop and grow as a coach, highly, highly recommend Lead Like a Pro. So Matthew, share how people can reach out to you, how they can find out more about the book, how they can get a, get a copy, and then I'll jump back in and wrap things up. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much um, for having me on, guys. This was awesome. Lead Like a Pro, uh, it, you know, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, wherever you get books, it, it's everywhere. It ships out immediately, um, so you can get it to pretty much the next day. So, um, but yeah, I appreciate the kind words about the book. Um, you know, if people have questions about the book, they want to reach out. Um, you know, I'm on LinkedIn. That's my, uh, that's my social media of choice. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty active there. People could always reach out and, you know, they got a question, they want to have a, a talk about leadership, uh, you know, always, always willing to take the time and, and love those conversations. Um, and then, you know, anybody could also, uh, check me out at, um, my last name, raidbardleadership.com. Um, do a, just a lot of different stuff with leadership. Um, going to be, you know, doing a leadership series and provide leadership training and just, just trying to give as coaches as many resources for, uh, you know, leadership development as I can to, uh, you know, hopefully just, you know, help this next crop of coaches and, and all of our current coaches who are in it right now, just be, you know, the best leaders that they can be. Appreciate your passion for the coaching profession. Congratulations on the book, lead like a pro. Any coach who goes out there and picks up a copy is going to be happy that they did. It's going to help you to grow and improve as a coach, as a leader, Matthew, cannot thank you enough for taking the time out of your schedule to jump on with us tonight. And to everyone out there, thanks for listening, and we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast, presented by Head Start Basketball.